men. Why are you glad that you broke up so quickly, story one? It's funny how life throws curveballs at you when you least expect them. This isn't my story, but it's one that hits close to home because it happened to my best friend. We've been tight since high school, went through some of the best and worst times together. We both ended up marrying women we met around the same time, which made it even better because our wives got along great too. We'd do all sorts of couple things together. Dinners, weekend trips, even just lounging around on lazy Sundays. Life was good. My friend and his wife met in culinary school, both of them chasing dreams of becoming top chefs. They were one of those couples that just clicked, you know? They had this chemistry that made you think, yeah, they're gonna make it. After a few years of dating, they tied the knot in a beautiful ceremony that my wife and I were honored to attend. We were close with them, especially his wife, who we really liked. She was sweet, funny, and had a way of making you feel like you'd known her forever. Not long after the wedding, my friend landed a job in the middle of nowhere, Texas. It was a decent opportunity, one that seemed too good to pass up, even if it meant moving to a small town far from everything they knew. She was a baker, a damn good one at that, but the only gig she could find was in the bakery at the local Walmart. It wasn't ideal, but it was something, and they figured it would be temporary until something better came along. A month or so passed, and we hadn't heard much from them. My wife and I had some big news, though. We had decided we wanted them to be the godparents of our son. It just felt right. They were practically family to us. So I gave my buddy a call, excited to share the news. He picked up, and we started catching up, talking about work, life, and all that. I was just about to bring up the godparents thing when he dropped a bomb on me. She's leaving me, he said, his voice shaky and hollow. I was stunned. I mean, they'd only been married a short while. What could have gone wrong so fast? He went on to tell me how she'd blindsided him one night after he came home from a late shift. She told him she wasn't happy, didn't love him anymore, and that she'd found someone else. My friend, desperate to save their marriage, begged her to stay. He suggested counseling, moving back home, anything that might help them work things out. But she was already gone in her mind. Then came the kicker. She revealed she'd been cheating on him with a stock boy from Walmart. Yeah, you heard that right. My friend's beautiful, talented wife was leaving him for a guy who stocked shelves at Walmart, a guy whose teeth were rotting out, and who was, by all accounts, not exactly a catch. This dude was in his late 20s, still living at home, barely getting by. And yet she chose him. It made no sense. If you're gonna cheat, shouldn't you be trading up, not down? It wasn't just the affair that hurt, though, it was who she chose to cheat with. My friend's mom had even seen them out together when she came to help him move back home. The whole thing was surreal and more than a little pathetic. A couple of years later, I heard that she ended up pregnant by this guy. They couldn't make ends meet and had to move into her mom's tiny two-bedroom apartment in a rough part of town. Meanwhile, my friend picked up the pieces of his life. He threw himself into his work, eventually landing a great job back in the city. A few years after the divorce, he met another woman, one who truly appreciated him. They got married, and as far as I know, they're still going strong. Nearly a decade later, they're happy, really happy and it's like all that pain he went through was just a bad dream. Story two. When I look back on my life, there are moments I wish I could rewrite, chapters that played out differently than I ever imagined. One of those pivotal times was when I was just 19 years old. She was 18 and we were barely adults, still trying to figure out who we were and what we wanted from life. Then she got pregnant, and everything changed in the blink of an eye. Her family was deeply conservative. The kind where getting pregnant out of wedlock was seen as a disgrace. So the pressure was on. It wasn't a question of if we'd get married, but when. I'd heard the term shotgun wedding before, but never thought I'd be at the center of one. But there we were, standing in front of a justice of the peace, saying vows we barely understood, let alone meant in the way we should have. The truth is, we hardly knew each other. We were kids, really. Kids thrust into a situation that required more maturity than either of us possessed. To make matters worse, I was dealing with a lot of stuff internally that I didn't fully understand. Undiagnosed mental, neurological, and physical issues plagued me, but back then, I didn't have the language or the knowledge to articulate what was going on. All I knew was that I felt off, and that feeling translated into me being unable to hold down a job. She wanted to stay home with the baby, which, in theory, was fine by me. But with me bouncing from job to job, our finances were a mess. We were living below the poverty line, scraping by on what little I could bring in. I was too proud to ask for help, too stubborn to admit that I couldn't provide for my family. The weight of that pride and the pressure to be something I wasn't ate away at me, making me more and more withdrawn. I wasn't abusive, not in the way people often think of abuse. 
I never raised a hand to her, never shouted or screamed. But I was negligent in a way that was just as damaging. I was so caught up in my own head, trying to figure out what was wrong with me, that I completely ignored what was happening to her. She was struggling too, emotionally, mentally, and physically, but I couldn't see it because I was too wrapped up in my own mess. I wasn't there for her in the ways that mattered, and I can only imagine how lonely she must have felt. Then one day I came home to find the place half empty. A lot of her stuff was gone, and there were divorce papers sitting on the coffee table, as if they'd been waiting for me all day. I didn't need to read them to know what they meant. It was over. She was gone, and I couldn't blame her. How could I? I'd failed her in so many ways, even if I didn't realize it at the time. The years that followed were rough, to say the least. It took a long time to come to terms with everything that happened to understand my role in it all. Eventually, I was diagnosed with the issues that had been plaguing me for so long, and I ended up on disability. But even with those diagnoses in hand, I don't consider them an excuse for how I behaved. I was an unpleasant person to be around, and I own that now. Somewhere along the way, I found it in myself to reach out to her, to apologize for everything, for the neglect, the emotional distance, the way I failed her when she needed me most. It wasn't easy, and it took time, but we've managed to find a place of peace. We're not what I'd call amazing friends, but we get along. We've both moved on, built our separate lives, and in a way, that's a blessing. It's more than I probably deserve, but I'm grateful for it nonetheless. Story 3. I was in my early 20s, naive in so many ways, and I got involved with a man who turned out to be nothing like what he pretended to be. At first, he seemed charming, confident, and sure of himself. Traits that I mistook for strength and character. But as time went on, the facade crumbled, revealing a deeply insecure and emotionally abusive person. The relationship was draining from the start. He was paranoid, always convinced I was cheating on him despite having no reason to think so. He refused to get a job, insisting it was my turn to take care of him, as if he'd ever taken care of anyone but himself. Before we moved in together, he lived with his mom, who doted on him like he was still a child. I didn't realize how much of a red flag that was until it was too late. He saw himself as a superior being, someone so enlightened and advanced that others couldn't handle his brilliance. It was as ridiculous as it sounds, but at the time, I was too deep in it to see things clearly. He never hit me, at least not at first, and coming from a messed up upbringing myself, I thought that meant the relationship wasn't asterisk that asterisk bad. I figured if there were no bruises or black eyes, it couldn't be abuse, right? That was the lie I told myself as I endured his constant gaslighting, his tantrums, and his endless need for validation. He believed everyone was out to get him because they were intimidated by his greatness. It was exhausting, trying to live up to the impossible standards he set while also walking on eggshells to avoid triggering his insecurities. The breaking point came one night after yet another argument. I went to bed early, hoping to escape the tension for a few hours. He stormed out of the house, probably expecting me to chase after him and beg him to come back. When he finally returned hours later, I could tell he was still seething with anger. I pretended to be asleep as he clomped around the room, huffing and puffing, trying to get my attention. He was desperate for me to wake up, to comfort him, to stroke his fragile ego. But I wasn't playing his game. I kept my eyes closed and my breathing steady, hoping he'd eventually give up and go to sleep. I thought I was in the clear when he finally stopped moving. But just as I was starting to relax, a sharp, crushing pain exploded across my left eye socket. He'd elbowed me in the face, hard. I shot up in bed, stunned and in pain, while he quickly rolled over to face the wall, pretending to be asleep. It was a cowardly, pathetic move, and it left me with a bruise that turned all the shades of a sick rainbow over the next few weeks. I tried to cover it with makeup, but there was no hiding what had happened. The bruise was a glaring reminder of the reality I was living in. Despite everything, I somehow convinced him to move back to my country with me. He agreed, seeing it as another opportunity to be taken care of and to live out his delusions of grandeur. He paraded around town in his military uniform, hoping to be showered with praise for his service, though he'd never actually gone on tour. He was a reservist, which he puffed up into some heroic narrative, trying to score free drinks at the pubs. Inevitably, he'd come home drunk, vomiting, and making a mess of everything. It was humiliating, but at the time... I was more worried about what would happen if I left. I knew I had to get out, but it took months to build up the courage and the support system I needed to make my escape. I was genuinely afraid of what he might do if I left, afraid he'd hurt our dog, set my family's house on fire, or worse. But in the end, he was just as cowardly as I suspected. 
When his visa ran out and he had no job, no prospects, and no one to sponsor him, he slunk back to England. I'm sure he rewrote the whole story in his head, painting me and my family as the villains to anyone who would listen. But that was a small price to pay for my freedom. Story 4 I grew up in a deeply religious household, one where the rules were strict and unforgiving. My mom was adamant that we couldn't just live in sin, so when I met someone and things got serious, marriage wasn't just an option, it was an expectation. We tied the knot and I packed up my life, moving across the country to be with him. It was all so fast, and in hindsight, we were both too young, too inexperienced to understand what we were getting into. At first, I tried to adjust to my new life, but it didn't take long for reality to set in. He worked long hours, 10, sometimes 12 hours a day, and by the time he got home, he was exhausted. His routine was rigid. Come home, watch asterisk top gear asterisk for a couple of hours, and then head straight to bed. Weekends weren't much better. Saturdays were reserved for his friends, Sundays for his family. As for us, there was barely any time for just the two of us. Our relationship was a shadow of what it should have been, a connection that was superficial at best and non-existent at worst. So there I was, living in a new place, far from everyone I knew, and feeling more alone than ever. The isolation started to get to me. I spent most of my days by myself trying to fill the void. That's when I started playing Asterisk League of Legends Asterisk with friends from back home. It was a way to reconnect with people, to feel less lonely. One day, one of those friends introduced me to a buddy of theirs and we hit it off immediately. We'd play for hours, talking about anything and everything. For the first time in months, I felt a spark, something I hadn't felt in my marriage. I knew what I was doing was wrong, but I justified it to myself in all sorts of ways. I told myself it wasn't serious, that it didn't mean anything. But deep down, I knew better. I could have ended my marriage, could have faced the problems head on, but I didn't. I was too immature, too scared to make the tough decisions. So I let it continue, hoping the situation would resolve itself somehow. But life doesn't work that way. One day, while I was asleep, my husband found the chats. There was no denying what was happening, no way to talk my way out of it. When he confronted me, I didn't even try to argue. Instead, I quietly bought a ticket and flew home, leaving everything behind. The guilt was overwhelming, but so was the relief. It was over, and now there was nothing left to do but pick up the pieces. When it came time to finalize the divorce, I paid for it. It felt like the least I could do. We didn't have any shared assets, so I sat down and wrote out the divorce decree myself. It only took a couple of hours, but it felt like a lifetime. My mom happened to be going on a cruise to Alaska with her best friend, and the port was in Washington, the same state where my husband was living. So I flew with them and arranged to meet him at a notary to get his signature. It was a strange, surreal experience. We met, signed the papers, and then went out to lunch together. There was no animosity, no anger, just two people who had tried and failed, but who could at least end things on amicable terms. We both admitted that we weren't ready for marriage, that we'd rushed into something we didn't fully understand. In a way, it was a relief to say it out loud, to acknowledge that we were better off going our separate ways. Since then, Life has taken us in different directions. I'm now with the love of my life, someone who truly understands me and with whom I share a deep, meaningful connection. As for him, he went on to have a more open dating life, exploring relationships at his own pace. We don't keep in touch, but I hope he's happy that he's found what he was looking for. Story 5 I grew up in a world where tradition and societal expectations held a firm grip on everyone's life choices. It was a world where marriage was less about love and more about fulfilling your duty to family and community. So when the time came for me to settle down, it wasn't surprising that an arranged marriage was on the cards. I didn't protest. I wanted to do what was expected of me, to make my family proud and to fit into the mold that had been set for me since birth. I didn't love her. How could I? We barely knew each other before we were married. But I convinced myself that love wasn't necessary, that it would come with time. Or maybe it wouldn't. But either way, it didn't seem to matter much. What mattered was that we were following the path laid out for us by tradition, by religion, by the society we were a part of. So we went through with it. We got married, and suddenly, I found myself in a relationship that felt more like an obligation than a partnership. Almost immediately after the wedding, it became clear that this wasn't going to be an easy road. She became incredibly dependent on me, not just financially, but emotionally. It was as if she had given up all sense of independence the moment we said our vows. I tried to be patient to support her, but it started to wear on me. The constant need for reassurance, the way she clung to me for every little decision, it felt suffocating. It was like dealing with a child who couldn't make a move without first asking for permission. 
Her unwavering devotion to our religion was another point of friction. She was deeply, devoutly religious, and while I had once been the same, something inside me had started to shift. The more time I spent in that marriage, the more I questioned the beliefs that had been drilled into me from birth. Religion had been the cornerstone of our union, the reason we were together in the first place, but now it felt like a chain around my neck, holding me back from the life I wanted to live. As time went on, I found myself pulling away from both her and the faith that had once guided my every move. I started to see things differently, to question the role religion played in my life, in my choices, in the way I viewed the world. It wasn't a sudden shift, but a gradual realization that I didn't believe in the things I was supposed to anymore. The rituals, the rules, the restrictions, they all started to feel meaningless to me. And with that realization came a growing resentment towards the life I was living. I tried to make it work, tried to find some middle ground where we could both be happy, but it became increasingly clear that we were on two very different paths. She was clinging to the faith with all her might, while I was drifting further and further away from it. Our conversations grew strained, our connection more distant. I couldn't take the baby girl attitude anymore, the way she leaned on me for everything, the way she refused to stand on her own two feet. It wasn't what I wanted in a partner, and it certainly wasn't what I wanted in a marriage. In the end, it felt like destiny was pushing us apart. I left the religion, and with it, I left the marriage. It wasn't an easy decision, but it was the right one for me. I couldn't keep living a life that felt so disconnected from who I really was. I needed to break free from the expectations, from the obligations, and from the person I had become in that marriage. It wasn't fair to her, and it wasn't fair to me. Story 6 I was just 19, barely old enough to know what love really was, let alone what it meant to sustain a marriage. We'd been together for a while, and there was a time when I genuinely cared for her, maybe even loved her in that innocent first love kind of way. But as time went on, that feeling faded. By the time we were standing at the altar, I knew deep down that my heart wasn't in it anymore. Yet I went through with it, convincing myself that it was what I had to do. I thought marriage was the natural next step, a duty I had to fulfill, even if my heart was no longer in it. Of course, it didn't take long for reality to hit. The love that had once been there had evaporated, and all that was left was the stark realization that we were just two people going through the motions. The marriage didn't last, and in hindsight, it never should have happened. It was a hard lesson learned, one that taught me that marrying someone out of obligation or fear of letting others down is a mistake you pay for in time, emotion, and regret. Then there was wife number two. I thought I'd learned my lesson from the first time around, that I'd be more careful, more sure of myself and my feelings. And for a while, things were good, really good. I loved her in a way I hadn't been able to with my first wife, and I truly believed we had something solid. But life has a way of throwing curveballs when you least expect it. One day, out of the blue, she had what I can only describe as a terrible accident. It's the kind of thing you wouldn't believe if you saw it in a movie, but it happened, right there, in real life. She slipped and, according to her, fell directly onto her co-worker's banana. And yes, you can take that exactly how it sounds. It wasn't just a literal banana we were talking about here. It was a not-so-subtle euphemism for something much more intimate. You could say she slipped into a situation that neither of us could easily get past. I don't know how she thought I'd react to that story, but it certainly wasn't with understanding or forgiveness. It was just too much, too absurd, too damaging to move beyond. I'd heard of plenty of excuses and strange stories in my time, but this one took the cake, or the banana, as it were. It wasn't something I could reconcile with, no matter how much I might have cared for her before. That marriage, unsurprisingly, ended soon after. I suppose you could say it was doomed from the moment she uttered that ridiculous excuse, but in truth it was probably on shaky ground before that. The incident just sped up the inevitable. It's funny how life works sometimes. How you can go from thinking you've found the right person to watching everything unravel over something as bizarre as slipping on a metaphorical banana. Story 7. We'd only been married for a week when I found out she cheated on me. It was a gut punch, something you never expect to happen, especially not so soon after saying I do. I didn't find out from her, though. She didn't confess or come clean. Instead, I noticed something off when she came back from a night out with her friends. She had her wedding ring on the wrong finger, like she couldn't be bothered to put it back where it belonged. That tiny detail sent my mind spiraling. You know how sometimes your gut just knows something before your brain can process it? That's what this was. I knew deep down that something had happened, but I couldn't bring myself to confront her about it. Not right then. A week later, I got a text from her saying she wanted a divorce. That was it. 
No explanation, no conversation, just a cold, abrupt text message that put an end to everything. I never saw her again after that. It was like she had vanished from my life as quickly as she had entered it. I can't say I was surprised, not really. By that point, I had already started to sense the cracks in our relationship, cracks that had probably been there long before we walked down the aisle. But here's the thing, there's always two sides to every story, and mine isn't the whole picture. I was recovering from a serious traumatic brain injury at the time, and I was on a lot of medication. I wasn't myself, not fully. My memory was foggy, my emotions all over the place. I was trying to piece my life back together. But the truth is, I was struggling just to keep my head above water. It wasn't exactly the best foundation for a marriage. And in hindsight, I can see how we both rushed into something we weren't ready for. I don't blame her for what happened. Maybe at first I did. I mean, who wouldn't feel betrayed after something like that? But as time passed, I started to understand. We were both in over our heads, trying to make something work that wasn't meant to be. She must have felt trapped, just as lost and confused as I was. I can only imagine the pressure she was under, being married to someone who wasn't fully present, who was dealing with a recovery that consumed so much of our lives. I wasn't the partner she needed, and she wasn't the partner I needed either, though I couldn't see it at the time. Story 8. When I first met my ex-wife, she was full of life and energy, someone who could light up a room just by walking into it. I was drawn to her optimism, her laughter, and the way she seemed to find joy in the smallest things. But behind that bright exterior was a shadow that I didn't fully understand until much later. Her family's influence over her was suffocating. They were the kind of people who didn't just offer advice or guidance. They demanded control over every aspect of her life. And as much as she loved them, their grip on her was choking the happiness out of our marriage. From the beginning, her family was always there, looming over us like a dark cloud. Decisions that should have been between the two of us were often hijacked by her parents, who felt entitled to have the final say. Whether it was about where we lived, how we spent our money, or even how we spent our weekends, they always had an opinion. An opinion that wasn't just suggested, but expected to be followed. At first, I tried to be patient, to understand that she was caught between the life she had with me and the life she had always known with them. But as time went on, it became clear that she was increasingly miserable under their thumb, and it was tearing us apart. 